when I'll be around. Um, but while I'm here and we're doing shameless plugs, hello. If anyone's going to be in the Newark, Delaware area this weekend, August 31st, our church is going to be showing in our gymnasium the movie Luca. It is a family. It says kids night out, but it's going to be a family night out. Free hot dogs, popcorn, snow cones. If you can come out, we're going to ask you to come out at 4 p.m. Come on out and have a good time. And then that Sunday, this Sunday coming up, we're having, we had over the entire summer, we had a family reunion series. And we talked about the family reunion, about us being the family in Christ and how we're called to come back together and support one another. And it meant a lot to me because I had a family reunion every year in Delaware. Delaware. But this Sunday, we're going to pull tables in the sanctuary. We're going to get worship word, and we're going to have our, 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 our senior pastor giving us an amazing word. But we're going to have food. It's going to be a great time. Our services start at 10 a.m. You are more than welcome to come on out. I'll be singing with our worship team, but it's going to be a great then. And then at the end of August, August 27th, that's a Friday night. I want you guys to come out. We're going to have a, it's, it's going to be a uh, barbecue. Oh, barbecue. We're going to have worship word, and we're going to have a lantern release, and also baptism. So if you've never gotten, take me to the water. If you've never gotten to the water, we're going to be baptizing that night as well. But we're going to be having a lantern release. What we're going to be doing is those things that might be holding us back, those things that might be troubling us, we're going to write them on a lantern, and we're going to actually release them back to God and say, God, you take it. Take it away. Take it away, Lord. Take it away take it away. So if you can make any of those dates, come on out. Uh, if, if I'm not there, just ask for me. I'm probably in the back washing dishes. They usually keep me in the back, Brother Walter. Um, but just come on out. We're going to invite you all out for amazing time out. Let's give the Lord one more hand clap of praise in this place. LCC showed up tonight. My family showed up tonight. My Facebook friends and Instagram friends, Lydia, and I always get this. I used to always call him JC. I thought he was Jesus Christ. His actual initials was CJ, and I'm always calling him JC. They came out. They saw it was here. I'm not to thank God for people that just love God, that love God, but also they love me. Amen. Amen. So let's, let's pray. Lord God, we just ask you to cover this night. We pray that you would just continue to flow in us and through us, God. Allow your word to be magnified at this moment, God. You know that I've studied, but I need your strength. I've prepared, but I need your power. I'm willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. So soundly now I wait for thee. Humbly I ask for thy will to see. Open mine eyes and illumine me. Spirit divine. Amen. Amen. We're going to jump right in. So you know that this week we were looking at living a 1313 life. And we know that 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 1313 life came out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we took it as verse 13, a 1313 life, where it says that these three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And so on the first night, we talked about this idea of faith over fear. How sometimes fear is holding us back from going to the place that God wants us to go. And last night, we talked about this hope cycle, this cycle of hope that, that, that we go in. And, 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 I, and, and we, I need real fast. I don't have that much time. I, 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 I only have an hour and a half tonight. But I don't have that much time. So, so, so if someone could tell me what was after hope, what was no books closed? Who cheated last night, brother? He cheated last night. Yeah, yeah, he's not here. All right, the cheater's not here. This is a closed book test. Who here is remember after hope? What's the next for? Suffering. Can you, April, can you help me out again tonight? And every book, uh, these are just journals. Thank you guys so much. Okay, so we had suffering, endurance. What was the last one? Who, who said that? All right, character. Yes, right. That was the cycle, the hope cycle that we went through. Thank you so much for remembering and making me feel loved. She stayed awake during the whole sermon. Amen. So we talked about this hope cycle, this thing that hope, that we, come, we start with hope from the beginning, our glory in Jesus Christ. Our, but after that, we come through some suffering as a people. But that suffering builds an endurance, and that endurance takes us to a character and builds character and takes us back to hope, and we become stronger. And it goes around and around and like this. But tonight, we're dealing with this thing called love. Woo, I was excited all day because I don't know if you can tell, but I love love. I do. I, I love hard. I love fast, too. 
I don't know if I got any other lovers in the house, but I, that's just me. If I love you, I love you. If I don't like you, I still love you. Oh, goodness. But, but most Christians will agree the fact that we're going to look at this idea of loving like Christ. But the question is, is that we, we know that this is love, but what is love? I mean, we hear the term, but what is love? Well, I can tell you two things that love is not. Love is not a feeling. Although feelings are a component of love, they are not the totality of love. Where, where's my slow down person? She said last night she was going to stand up and say, Pastor Larry, slow down. Okay. So I'm going to slow down. If, if, if I go too fast, do not feel upset with standing up and go. I want you to get this. And sometimes I'm so excited about the word I jump in. So I'm going to whew, take a breath and slow this thing down. Amen. But love, that, that, that idea of the feeling is not the totality of love. Love is not an emotion, although emotions are a component of love. They are not the totality of love. True love. True love will change the hearts of men and women. True godly love will move this world where lives are transformed, where, where strongholds are broken, where chains and bondage are set free. True love does all of those things. And it's in that first chapter of Corinthians, I mean, excuse me, that first book of Corinthians, the 13th chapter, where, where, which most would call the love chapter. If, if someone says, turn to the love chapter, it's usually talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul gives us a great way to see exactly what this godly love looks like. And in verses 1 through 3, Paul just lays it down. He, he talks about the idea that, that you can speak in tongues, you can prophesy, you can have the gift of understanding, you can have so much faith that you can move mountains, you can give everything away, even give your life. But if you don't have love, you ain't got nothing. And I know that's a double negative, but that's okay. You don't have anything, Paul says. And then on ver verses 4 through 8, he gives, he almost, Paul puts on his baker's hat and, and, and his chef jacket, and he, and he gives us the ingredients of love. He, he gives us the, the, the idea that love is patient. It's slow to grow angry. It's kind. It's considerate. It's not harsh and not jealous or envious. It doesn't brag or admit it's, it, it admits its faults when it's wrong. It's not proud or arrogant. It's, not, it's polite. It acts appropriately. It shows respects to others. It's not self-centered but other-centered. It seeks to edify others and not to edify itself. It puts others before itself. It's not easily provoked. It doesn't keep account when wrong. It's not bitter. It's not resentful or vengeful. It doesn't find joy in evil. It finds joy in goodness. It bears truth. It bears or covers all. It believes all. It hopes for all. It endures for all things. Love, not people, never fail. Sometimes when people fail us, we think it's the love. Love doesn't fail. People will sometimes fail us. Now, the difficult thing about this word called love is that in the English language, all we have is that one word, love. And, and, and we have to understand that when we go back to the Greek and Hebrew, they had many words for this word called love. But here in the English language, it's just, I mean, I look at my wife, Jessica, and I say, baby, this is my best Morris chestnut. Baby, I love you. I should have got more. Oh, <laughs> baby, I love you, baby. But with my boys, I mean, man, I love me a good cheesesteak. I mean, ketchup, mustard, extra fried onions. It's love. Hopefully, hopefully there's a difference between the two. Hopefully my wife understands that I don't love her to the same extent or vice versa. I'm sorry. I don't love the cheesesteak <laughs> to the same extent. As I love her. A Freudian slip, Brother Walter. <laughs> but we only have that one word for love. But we, like you said, in the Hebrew and the Greek, there's many words. There's, there's a word called eros. Everyone said eros. That's the physical type of love. This love is not found in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, you find in such books as the Song of Solomon. It deals with the physical part 
of love. It's associated with the physical love, the sex, the deep, intimate love that a husband should have towards his wife and vice versa. Whenever I counsel couples, I mean, we like to get deep and godly, John. You know, we like to, you know, you know, look for the inner goodness of the person, you know, the soul and the, you better have a little eros in that relationship too. I'm sorry, I'm real. You better like that wife a little bit that, that, that she does a little something for you. Now, now, I'm not saying to, that, that you have to have it this way, that he has to be this tall and have this amount of hair and, and this build, but there has to be a little bit of physical attraction in that relationship. So Eros is not a bad thing, but it's just the lowest level of love. It's superficial. The next one is phileo. That's talked about shared experiences. It's, it's expressed as a friendship and usually looked at as a brotherly love. That's where we get the word phile. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. We might have been the Myrtle capital for a little while, but we'll wrap our arms around you first. Philadelphia, this is the, this is the type of love that David had for Jonathan. They were not brothers, but David and Jonathan had this phileo love, this brotherly love, to the point that Jonathan covered David to keep him safe when he was running from his father Saul. And David looked after Jonathan's family after Jonathan had died. His son, Mephibosheth, after he had died, he looked after him. That was the type of brotherly love that, that we see in scriptures. And this is the love that 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 Peter is replying back to Jesus in, in John chapter 21, verse 15, when Jesus is saying to, to Peter, Peter, do you deeply, intently, godly love me? And Peter responds back to Jesus, Jesus, you know I fillet you. You know, you know I fillet you. And Jesus is saying, well, no, no, do you deeply, godly, intently love me? And Peter says, Jesus, you know I fillet you. This is the, the, con, the conversation that's going back and forth between Peter and Jesus, the flail. Now, there's a third type of love. It's called a community's life love. It's called storge. It's a natural love and affection that a parent has for a child. Now, this is not found in Scripture, but it is used in a compound way in Scripture. In, in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, that comp compound word, uh, a philo storgos. It, 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 it says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. That word love is the compound word of phileo and storge put together. But there's a fourth type of love. And this is the love that God wants from us. This is the love that he wants you to show to one another. It's agape love. Agape love. This is an intimacy with God. This is a spiritual, supernatural, unconditional love that God is pulling us into, not just to show back to him, but it's a love that he wants us to show to one another. Who here knows that God wants us to agape one another? Agape love goes above politics. Oh, don't talk about it, and I'm not going to talk about it. But your agape should outweigh whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat. I'm sorry. Your agape should outweigh whether or not you're black or you're white. Your agape should outweigh whether or not you're rich or trying to be rich. Hallelujah. I don't like to say poor. Because I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm making my way up. I'm climbing the stairway. But that agape love is the one that God wants us to exhibit to one another. It's the result of that interchange of the Holy Spirit coming within us and changing us from the inside out. This type of love is given because of the character of the giver rather than the worthiness of the object of that love. It's the character of the person giving it. It's love in spite of, this is good, rather than because of. In spite of what you do, I love you. You, you, you. you may stab me in the back. You may talk ill about you, but guess what? I still love you. That's the love that changes our world. That's the love that's going to take us to a whole different level if we can get on that page. I'm not looking to the government to change the world. I'm looking to the church. Why? Because God gave us the example 
on how to love. We're the only place that's called different people from different backgrounds and different cultures to come together to be one. We should be showing the world how to do it. But it takes this agape type of love. God doesn't do love. God is love. That's who he is. That's his very character. And guess what? When we receive the Holy Spirit within our lives, we receive that same ability to love like God. It's not optional. So if you are a believer, if you say that you're a Christian, I'm going to look on the way that how you love others. I'm not saying that you understand everyone. I'm not saying that you get it all. But how do you love others? So the question tonight is that we're looking at this principle of godly love. We know that it's intrinsic. We know that it's universal. We know that it's unconditional. We know that it's sacrificial. We know that it's contagious. But the crazy, the crazy thing about God's love is that it's, it's motivating. It shouldn't motivate us to do. It shouldn't motivate us for change. It shouldn't motivate us to be better than we were. So to do this, we're going to go to John chapter 15. Verses 9 through 13. I'm going to read it real fast for you. And it's a New Living Translation. And this is Jesus saying, this is Jesus says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Jesus gives them a commandment. He says, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Love. Can I hear love? Let me hear it. Love. Love is huge. Love in this world is huge. I mean, think about it. Love drives a billion-dollar industry called music. Billion, think about it. A billion or more dollars have been produced by songs written about love. Usher, he found love in the club. Neo and Rihanna talked about that. I hate that I love you. My father's favorite rapper, Heavy D, said, I got nothing but love for you, baby. And the smooth LL Cool J, Lady Loves Cool J, he talked about that I need love. That, that's a little bit before you. Okay, let's go back. New edition talked about if it isn't love. Whitney Houston said, I will always love you. Beyonce and Jay-Z, they were dangerously in love, not once, but twice. They had crazy love. They had love on top, and then they ended it by being drunk in love. Force MDs, that's my generation, they sang about that love is a house. The five heartbeats says the a heart is a house for love. The love minister, Barry White, said, can't get enough of your love, baby. Supreme said, baby love. The OJs rode us on the love train and, and for the love of money. And there are some songs that you always have to, you can just hear the beginning of it. And you know what it is. It's... Come on, y'all. Love and happiness. Y'all are going straight to H-E double hockey sticks. <laughs> Our grit screen. That's right. You don't know about that? Let me say, Captain and Tennille said, love will keep us together. Meatloaf sang a song that I would do anything. He said he'd do anything for love. The Beatles said, love me do. She loves you. Money can't buy you love and all you need is love. I mean, love was so intense that two lions in Disney sang, can you feel the love tonight? Love is huge. Love had his own boat. Think about it. Love, exciting and new. It said, come on board, we're expecting you. Love, the love boat. If you know that, you're above 45. <laughs> I was one of probably the only few black kids in Philadelphia probably watching The Love Boat and MASH. I love those two shows, but that's all right. That was my diversity training, I think. <laughs> amen and amen. 
But these songs that we sing, Jesus didn't sing these songs. He didn't talk about love. Jesus showed love. And he commands those that were closest to him, and he commands us today to love. He gives us an example in, in 1 Corinthians 13. But the key is, I don't ever want to just tell you to love, and let's, let's wrap up the service. But how do we love like Christ? There's going to be four points, and I'm going to hit them, and we're going to be going so I can get you guys to pick up your kids. i got to pick up my girls because I promised them I'll take them to the pool tonight. <laughs> Amen. The first way we love like Christ, the first way is we have to accept others the way that Jesus accepts you. Oh! Oh! We live in a cancel culture where rejection is real, and the issue affects the fact that, that, that this rejection teaches us to act a certain way, to react a certain way, to retaliate and relate to others in a certain way. And the idea of feeling needed or accepted can sometimes cause us to do crazy things, especially us young men. If you have young boys in the house, you know what we will do to get the attention of a girl. We will break a collarbone trying to do a backflip off our bed. We do some foolish things to try to be accepted by other people. But the one thing I want to let you know that you will never be accepted by everyone. Let me just lay that to you right now because I was a, please, I was a people pleaser. I don't know if you can tell that. But I used to be a people pleaser. I wanted everyone to like me. But when I was going through the State Police Academy, there was one guy who didn't like me. Who can believe that when I was going through the State Police Academy, they called me Smiley. I wonder why they would get something silly like that up. Well, he didn't like me, so I went to his room one day, and I was like, listen, I got to talk to you about this. Like, I, 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 what, did I do something? Because I've been known to say some things, to, to not to think. There's really no, there used to be no filter between here and here. But can you believe that I do have a filter on it now? <laughs> but I went to him, I said, what's going on? And he, guess what? He said that I don't like you because you're too happy. That's when I was like, okay, okay, well, if that's why you hate me, then I can't do anything about that. I mean, don't, I mean, hate me because I'm beautiful, but you know, because I'm happy. <laughs> but you're not going to please everyone. Listen, Jesus was perfect, and they still nailed him to the cross. Per if they did that to him, what are they going to do to you? We have to accept others. How God and Jesus accepts us. How does God accept us? John, John 6, 37. It says, however, those that the Father has given me will come to me. I will never what? I will never reject them. To be fully accepted, not based on conditions. And it's hard because most of us all learned love through conditional experiences. Do this for me, and I'll do that for you. So I'll take you to the movies. Then I'll... Conditions. But God is unconditional. He, he loves you not because of who you are, but he loves you because of who he is. He doesn't love you because of what you do. He loves you because of what he's done. He doesn't love you because of your conduct. He loves you because of his character. Someone say love. Love. Unconditional love and acceptance was best seen by the woman caught in adultery. They bring, and, and, and this, is, this is the part, they bring her to Jesus. And, and, and usually adultery takes two people. But they bring her to Jesus because they really weren't worried about the issue. They were trying to trip Jesus up. And, and they said, Jesus, what you going to do? Because normally in the Old Testament, if someone's caught in adultery, they get stoned. And I'm not talking about rolling up a doobie and sitting down and smoking one. They were stoned. And so they bring her to Jesus, and Jesus, I love, I always have this imagery. They said he just bent down and started writing in the sand. It doesn't tell you what he wrote, but I'm, I'm picturing that he probably wrote uh, uh, Philip Lou, one of the guy's names, or, or, or John Jaws, or whatever. And these guys started to move away because they understood what they had been and what they had done. And he says, he says uh, uh, you know, who is without sin, throw, throw the first stone. And, 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 and pretty soon, everyone's going except her and Jesus. We're talking about acceptance. He says, where are your condemners? Where are they? And, and the woman says, they're not here. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you either. He tells her to go, but he doesn't leave her with that. He says, go and sin no more. He accepted her, but he didn't approve of what she had done or what she was doing. Acceptance is 
not approval. We have to get that in our mind. We want people, and we, this world wants us to accept them, and I will accept you for who you are, but I cannot always condone or approve what you're doing. And I can love you no matter what. Can, can, can I be honest right now? No? Okay, I'm about to say, we've been honest all week. I thought there's something changed on Wednesday. One of my best friends growing up, two doors down from me, my birthday's July 23rd, his birthday was July 24th. He lives away now. He is openly in a man-on-man relationship. But I love him. I love him to death, and I love talking to him. Because why? Because I want to share Christ. Because Jesus was about talking to you and loving you and relating to you. He wasn't about putting you down. I want to show you the love of Jesus Christ. That's what draws people to Christ. Not just throwing a Bible in someone's face. I accept you. He knows that I don't approve, but I love you. How do we show others that they're accepted? By encouraging others to do right and building them up in the Lord. Romans 15, 2. We should help each other to do right simply. And it says, once again, to build them up in the Lord. That's, that's the first thing. Secondly, how do, we, how, do we, how do we love like Christ? We value others like Christ values you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You were created by God. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit now resides in you. The fact that Luke 12, 6 through 7 tells us if Jesus cares for the sparrows, how much more does he care for you? He knows the very hairs and the lack thereof on your head. I told you I can't have good looks and hair. But if he loves the sparrows, how much more does he love and value? He says, you are valuable to God. More valuable than a whole flock of sparrows. But what makes things valuable? First of all, what makes something valuable is, the, is who made it. That's the first thing. I, 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 I heard Brother Mike talking about his car yesterday. I love the Kia. I think the Kia, who, who makes the tell, run, um, tell you run, tell you ride? Is that a Kia or a Hyundai? Kia, I love those trucks. But if you put that in the same lane as a BMW, you'll see which one costs the more. A Mercedes-Benz and a Hyundai. It depends on who made it. That's the first component on whether or not it's valuable. Now, listen, Jesus has made us. So how should we think of ourselves as being valuable? Ephesians 2.10 says you are God's masterpiece, his poema, his poem. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we should do great things or good things. He's planned for us a long time ago. First is who's made you. That's the first component of whether or not something is valuable. And secondly, it depends on what someone is, worth, is willing to pay for it. That's what makes that thing valuable. How much did it cost? Two, two, I got two words. The cross. That's how much God loves you and me, Ephesians 1, 18 and 19, says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the... And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose its value. 19, it was the... We talked about that precious blood of Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. That's how much you were worth. He was willing to pay it all. That's how valuable we are to God. That's how much he loves us. So that's how we should look at others. How do we value others? We have to look and love. Mark 10, 21, this is the man that said, God, what do I need to do? And he tells him, you need to sell everything you have, the rich man. Sell everything you have. And he was, he was, he was hot. He was hurting because he had a lot of stuff. But verse 21 says that, Jesus looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. That's seeing the person for who they are. We have to be willing to see each other for who we are. That gives value. That affirms the value that's within him. The third, what's the third thing? The third thing, we need to forgive others <laughs> as Christ has forgiven us. Not holding grudges, not waiting on something or getting back on something, not looking for the consequences, the good and the bad. It's forgiving others like God forgives us. Isaiah 4, 43, 25 says, I, even I am he. That blots out your transgressions. That blotting means that it, it takes it off the page completely. 
And for my own sake, I will not remember your sins. If God has forgotten it, why are you holding it against yourself and other people? It's love. That's how much God loves you and how much he loves me. We are forgiven people. And we can walk that way without the weight of condemnation. It says there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. Those who are in Christ Jesus who walk according to, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But how do we forgive others? Because it's hard. I was a person that held grudges. How do we forgive others? By remembering that not only Christ, that only Christ is perfect and without fault. And the rest of us is jacked up. <laughs> Tore up from the floor up. He's the only one that's perfect. I'm going to get it wrong. Colossians 3.13. Make allowance for the, each other's faults. Forgive Anyone who offends you, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. You got to forgive them. If you can't forgive them, how can you expect God to forgive you? And the last one. Lastly, we have to believe in others the way that Jesus believes in you. We have to be optimistic, not believing the worst, believing the best. Believing in others and believing the best for others. We have certain insecurities that, that, that sometimes make it hard to encourage not only ourselves but to encourage other people. But I want you to be committed to saying that I am committed to believe in my brothers and sisters. I'm going to believe the best out of you and for you. I'm believing that all things are possible. And even in those moments that I'm struggling, I love the idea in Mark chapter 9 when, when Jesus heals the demonic boy and the father goes to Jesus and says that, 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 that my son throws himself in and out the fire. He says, have mercy on us. And he says, if you can. He's talking to Jesus now. He says, Jesus, if you can. And Jesus says, if I can? Jesus says, anything is possible if a person believes. And watch what the father says. He says the father instantly cried out, I do believe. But help me overcome my unbelief. It's saying that, God, I believe, but there's certain areas that's tough for me. It's tough for me to love this type of way. Help me out. Come on and help a brother out. I want to encourage you to constantly be driven by those ideas. Those ideas are saying, how do I love like Christ? To go to each and every one of those ideas because the whole the whole object of, of, that, of Christ and his love and, and, and encouraging and improving others is having a good self-image of yourself. It's having that, 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 that idea because there was a, um, a psychologist that said that um, usually our self-image is largely determined by what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. I'm going to say that again. Usually our self-image is largely determined by what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. Who's the most important person in your life? Is Jesus the most important person in your life? So I only care what Christ thinks about me. So what does Christ think about me? He says that I love you. He says, I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. I'm right there with you. He loves every part of me and he loves every part of of you, the hard parts, the ups, the downs, the dirty underwear under the bed. He loves every part of you. We love like Christ by loving that way. The idea of us believing and knowing and understanding that we are loved and that we are accepted, that we're valued, that we're forgiven, and that we're believed in, in this life, allows us to Go further into love like Christ. I want to leave you with this verse. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. Love like Christ. It'll change the world. It'll change you. And that's where true change begins. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you once again for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness, God. We thank you that even in the midst of our hard times, that you still loved 
us. So God, I pray that you would get the glory out of our lives. That, that when we're down, God, that we could lift our heads from what's, to the hills from what's cometh our help because we know that our help comes from the Lord. Show us, God, more of your love. Allow us to be living examples of that love in this world so that change can happen. We thank you, God. Move as only you can move. And we'll give your name all glory, all honor, and all praise in Jesus Christ's name. We do pray in the name of God. Shout amen. 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 And amen. Let's give the Lord one more hand clap of praise.